started. Um, see folks are still filing in, so feel free to um, join us. And we're excited for this call. Uh, so first off, welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of your financial advisor, I'm excited to welcome you to this month's Baird Wealth Strategies webinar, uh, Turkey Talk, your recipe to talk about wealth with family. So um, as we approach the holiday season, we feel this topic will be very timely. We're joined today by a number of Baird experts, Julie White, Director of Baird Family Wealth, CJ Jessup, Manager of the Wealth Planning Associates, Linda Grant, Wealth Strategist, and Jonathan Raymond, Charitable Solutions Strategist. They're going to lead this presentation, um, which is designed to help you in securing your legacy, strengthening family bonds, and create a secure future together. Uh, before I turn the call over to them, um, just a few housekeeping items I'd like to highlight. First off, for optimal viewing, we suggest setting your layout to the side-by-side -side view via the circle in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, all participants are in listen-only mode, but we would love to hear from you. We will host a Q&A session at the end of the call to address as many questions as time permits. Um, you can submit a question by clicking on the Q&A icon. Please just be sure to address your question to all panelists. Um, this presentation is being recorded and will be available along with the slide deck through your Baird Financial Advisor about a week um, following today's call. So with that, um, thank you all for joining us today. I'll now turn the call over to you, Julie. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Corbin, and welcome, everyone. It's hard to believe we're only five weeks away from Thanksgiving and the start of the holiday season. So as we were talking uh, among ourselves about all the activities that take place then, one thing that always comes back to us as we're all involved in planning with families with your advisors is really about the dynamics that exist in, in, in every family and what a opportune time the holidays are to really have some of those necessary family conversations um, that always bring out the natural family dynamics in every family. As one of my friends said, she's like, it's like when all my siblings get back together, we're 12 again, and all those natural dynamics come back out, uh, just like we were kids, even though we're 45 now. Uh, and so we just wanted to lay a little background for you, but our goal for today is to give you some thoughts and ideas on really intentional family conversations that you might want to kind of plan to have this holiday season that we think are really important to have enduring families that are high functioning and really have purpose to them. So uh, when we talk about family dynamics, it doesn't mean dysfunctional family. Family dynamics exist in every family situation. Uh, they can be based on birth order, uh, by geography, just by the natural uh, way a person receives information and communicates, but it's really helpful to understand how each person in your family naturally communicates with each other and what those dynamics are that go on in your family. The reason it's so important that all of us on the call are involved with your advisors in doing in-depth planning, whether it's estate planning, income planning, retirement planning, but really planning for those life events. And the goal is always to have families that are high functioning and enduring through the generations. What we have now is some information that really tells us what are some of the stumbling blocks to that. You may have heard the phrase shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generation. It's a global phenomenon. The wealth is created in one generation, somewhat preserved in the other, not much in the third and dissipates by the fourth generation in all too many cases. In fact, in well over half the cases but it's not necessary. And what we have now is some facts around what actually causes that. The biggest cause to that is lack of communication in a family, talking about those uncomfortable things, talking about shared values, talking about how decisions get made in the family. That's the reason that 60% of the time that family wealth gets dissipated in three generations. The next most common reason is lack of preparing that rising generation in your family for their stewardship roles. And CJ's got some really interesting insights he's gonna share with us about that. Uh, so we hope that this gives you uh, some spark of ideas of questions, conversations you might wanna have when your family gathers this holiday season. And I'm gonna start with Jonathan because this is one of Jonathan's favorite times of the year. Uh, Jonathan and his role at Baird Trust really works with families, with their advisors 
on their philanthropic intent and how to execute on those. So, Jonathan, I know you meet with a lot of families this time of year. Tell us about some of those conversations and really what you think that families could do to enhance those conversations over the holidays. Thank you, Julie. And yes, this definitely is one of my favorite times of the year. And really, the reason why is this is a very natural conversation for Thanksgiving. Uh, move on right here. Uh, many of our families really take this opportunity and this time of year to decide on where they want to give, whether that's from their family foundations, whether that's from donor advised funds, or just even volunteering together. Those the ways of giving back don't always have to be in the form of a check, they can actually be an activity that families work on together. So they might go down to a, a soup a, a kitchen. They might to spend some time together, you know, planting something in the community. Uh, a lot of times those families might assume that uh, other members know what they care about. Uh, you know, even when they know where the family members might give to or where they might volunteer at, they don't, a lot of times we find out that they don't. Uh, there's a lot behind that that uh, maybe the family is just given to the same organization for year after year, or just another family or a friend roped them into uh, being involved in a particular organization. And so this is a great opportunity to develop those bonds. Uh, what again, whether it's through actual giving in a cash monetary sort of way or with their time. And the great thing about philanthropy, and this is where I think it provides a way to truly strengthen our families, is that it can provide a non-stressful way to engage in family. Uh, we're able to do something together as a group. We're able to do something that we feel good about. There's a palpable sense of satisfaction and being able to give back and actually see that, uh, see that those rewards. And that's why I always like to encourage uh, families and actually have done the same thing and raised within my own family, these types of questions to deepen our shared experience. You know, a lot of families have this game going around the table, what they're thankful for this year. And that's always a great way to start is how do we show gratitude? What are we thankful for this year? And what we notice is Part of that's going to be a reflection of what happens in that given year in the history of the past 12 months, but there's always a core that remains. And so it's a great way of starting to engage and, and get everyone involved. But beyond that, beyond just even thinking about those ways of gratitude and saying that we want to pay it forward and express that uh, satisfaction from this past year, is really figuring out what is our family's legacy. And that comes down to what does it mean to be a Raymond? What does it mean to be a Smith? You know, we want to figure out who are we? What are our core values? And a lot of times that goes back to maybe some stories, things that we do together. Uh, how can we honor some of the generations that brought us here, especially when we're thinking back about maybe the wealth creator in a family that might have been a couple of generations ago. And if we are giving gratitude, showing thanks, you know, how can we honor those and continue that trend? And when we that's looking back, when we want to go forward, how do we pass some of those same values on to our children? And what values do we want to show and express to others? The one other thing that I always like to mention at this point is how do we meet each family member where they are on their philanthropic journey? Especially when we're coming together for the holidays, we've got multiple generations together. Uh, those are all at different life stages and some might be in retirement, some might be in elementary school, that whole, whole range there. And that doesn't mean that we can always have the same answer for every single family member. But being able to have these discussions of what is it, what does it mean there? And one of the great ways that I always like to think about this is uh, involving children, involving our children. That might just be putting a dollar in a donation bucket at some event that you go to, or it might be, you know, we as a family are going to volunteer at the soup kitchen. And as part of that, we would like every one of us to, to bring something. And that way, there's something that each member holds that is they can actually 
hand over and again, make it real. Because simply writing a check that might mean something for one family member, being able to actually express that more deeply uh, by a, having that uh, even the youngest members are a family. The virtues and the habits that we generate really when we are five years old, those are the ones that are really going to develop into who we are uh, going forward in the next decades going forward. So if we want to be able to engage the entire family in philanthropy, it really is getting everyone involved where they, where they are currently. A lot of times suggest uh, giving some sort of a bucket or some sort of allowance that uh, a family member can use for, uh, for their, their giving and to, again, feel like they're having a contribution. Yes. Before you go, one of the things that I've heard you talk about for when you talk about how to get the family involved is the prevalence of donor advised funds. So many of our clients have started contributing to donor advised funds, but uh, so they contribute a large bucket into the donor advised funds and then make contributions out of that over the years. So is that something that families can, you know, get involved with and discuss? And if you've done that, how once if you should pass away, what happens to that donor advice fund? Can other family members step in and continue those contributions? And how how do we get that all arranged? That is, that is a wonderful question. And that's when I was talking about maybe buckets and having each generation being involved to some extent and being able to make some of those decisions. Uh, the contributor to those donor advice funds, the great thing about donor advice funds, it is a investment vehicle where those funds can be set aside. They're going to be for charitable purposes, but all the growth in those uh, until they're given away is going to be tax free. Um, and so that really is something that the family can share in as a whole. And so you have the individuals that might contribute to the donor advised fund, but then really engaging and letting those other family members each have some sort of voice, some sort of autonomy in giving that away. And when you do that, that is that natural conversation. That is understanding what do we care about? What do we want to give? Uh, but then also setting up the future advisors for that donor advised fund. When you have a donor advised fund, there's always going to be some family member that is the advisor. When we have the next generation, they're going to be those upcoming advisors. And when they're involved in this process, they're going to be able to continue to honor and continue to engage with that donor advised fund uh, in the way that the family unit as a whole uh, sees as advancing itself. So it's, and that's a, it's a great vehicle. It's a great uh, opportunity for those family members to, again, all feel like they've got some bucket, some involvement uh, over those funds and can, can give back. Jonathan, I've got, I've got something for you too quick. So. Uh, IRAs, RMDs, QCDs, the alphabet soup of, of retirement accounts. Um, QCDs are a, a big thing or qualified charitable distributions. Those come up a lot, especially towards the end of the year. Um, can you talk about what a QCD is, what that means for somebody and how that might uh, be incorporated into their, their philanthropic goals as well? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, the one uh, unfortunate thing is a, a QCD cannot be contributed to a donor advised fund. Uh, uh, so just want to get that out there. They can be contributed to a designated fund. So that is something that you might want to talk to your advisor about. Uh, and that is a, basically a subset of a donor advised fund. But the reason why we talk with a lot of our families and their clients about uh, uh, qualified charitable distributions from their uh, traditional IRAs is that any of the distributions from an IRA are going to come as taxable income. And so if that income is not needed by the family in a particular year, they may still have to take it if they're subject to uh, required minimum distributions, or even if they're not subject to required minimum distributions, if they're 70 and a half, um, maybe still don't have to take that, but they know that they've got a substantial amount that's built up in the IRA. Anytime those distributions come out of an IRA, they would be taxable. Being able to use a QCD, means that you can take a distribution from that IRA without incurring any tax uh, at all, uh, up to $100,000. 
and give it directly in the hands of the charities that you care about. And a lot of times there's a misunderstanding that people say, well, why don't I just take from the IRA and then I'll just make my normal contributions? Where that runs into problems is a lot of times people might not be able to use their full standard deduction. Um, uh, otherwise, the, when they itemize, uh, and so they actually get a better benefit by giving directly and not recognize any income in the first place. The other reason why it's important is there are a lot of those deductions that might phase out or might have uh, various uh, Medicare premiums that increase that are based off of your adjusted gross income. So avoiding that ever re being recognized as adjustable as income is always a great alternative. So we always encourage if you avoid having to recognize uh, IRA income as as income, it's definitely to our client's advantage. Now, at the heart of a lot of these questions that I've mentioned here, it really does come down to stories. And often there's an event or experience that aligns the donor with the organization or causes that they support. Linda, I know that uh, family stories are something that you really focus on, and I'd, I'd love for you to share a little bit more about how you work with the families with storytelling. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And I, I love to listen to how you help families aggregate their sense of purpose. And I wanted to talk about how, how is it that you get families to talk about their values? Hey, dad, what do you value? Oh, uh, hard work. Well, that's okay. That's like saying, hey, let's go vacation at coordinate 48 degrees north and 60 degrees west. Well, that's not really inspiring. That doesn't stick with me. Oh, hard work, that's what I value. What sticks with me is let's go to Belize, an island, a, a country off of Central America that has azure blue seas where we can go diving in one of the best reefs in the world. The context is what will help motivate and inspire and help people talk about their values and what they hold to be dear. So storytelling, in my mind, is one of the best ways that we can pull the values out of the previous generation. When I get together with my family at Thanksgiving, I think a lot about how many of us might not be here next year. I know that sounds a little bit morbid, um, but it does occur to me that all the stories that the elder generation has and has maybe hidden within their heart, I might not know. And I'd like to know because that's going to help shape me and help shape, help shape my children and my grandchildren. So stories have to be told or they die. And when they die, we can't remember who we are or why we are here. That's a quote from Sue Monk Kidd, who is the author of The Secret Life of Bees. Stories are memory aids, instruction manuals, and moral compasses. This is from Alex Krotowski, who's an author, a broadcaster, a journalist, and a social psychologist. So I want to share with you a story that aids me today that came from my grandmother, Nana, and grandpa. So grandpa came from Scotland at age 18. All he had to his name were his skills as a Finnish carpenter apprentice and also as a farmer, a dairy farmer. He met my grandmother, who was only first generation herself here to the U.S., who was working in a factory at, in eighth grade. So working in a factory counting threads, but they noticed that she was fairly smart. So they took her back up to the, um, the office version of the factory and had her actually start doing accounting because she was very good with numbers. She never did finish beyond the eighth grade, but she did marry my grandfather and they decided to take a risk and put all that they have into purchasing land. And that land is now been farmed and is passed down to the fourth generation through the vehicles of trust. But the point that I'm making here is my grandparents, through that story, shared with us the value of hard work, the value of joining together, joining forces, and collaborating with each other as partners to make a go of it, and also the value of taking a risk. So while work hard was the coordinates, the story really shaped what values they held dear. Ooh, not yet. <laughs> Stories.
storytelling offers the opportunity to talk with your audience and not at them. We've always been structured maybe to tell the next generation what they ought to do, when actually we might want to paint the picture or ask them what they want to do or paint the picture. So it's kind of a non-threatening way to show them what we'd like to see them do. One more story for you. My father, Again, the son of an immigrant from Scotland, he also was not educated beyond high school. And he was working in a dairy farm at the University of Connecticut, making $70 a week when he married my mother. As a gift to my mother, my father wrote my mother a check for $1 million dated 10 years out in the future. Now he's earning $75 a week how did you think he was going to get to a million dollars for my mom to be able to cash that check in the future? He did it by discipline, by looking for opportunity, and by keeping a positive mindset. Do you see how that story communicates the value? And all you have to do when you're together with your relatives is ask them something they're proud about during their lifetime. What regret did they have by not completing before they, before they expire? What are they most happy about when they see in action? Ask each other these questions so we can communicate the values to each other rather than telling each other how best to live. With that, I'm going to hand over to the next generation, CJ Jessup, my teammate, who is also the Wealth Planning Associate Manager and pretty wise for his years. And CJ, I'm going to have you talk about the next generation point of view. Yeah, I appreciate it, Linda. So Linda touched on a topic that I didn't plan on talking about, but I do want to call it out. A big thing that I think we hear about quite a bit now is, is manifestation or manifesting. So thinking about something and becoming that something. And I, I, big on TikTok, that's next gen too. Um, there's a few clips that I've seen recently uh, that really involve that idea. What you think about is what you become. And Linda's story, I think, is a great example of that, is that million-dollar check. You don't become a million dollars, but you become the person that's earned that, that's put that time in, that's done the right things to get to that point. Um, so Jerry Garcia uh, from The Grateful Dead is not exactly the, the right next step, but this is where I want to start. Uh, quote from him, I'm sure folks have heard this before, um, what a long, strange trip it's been. Now, to Jerry Garcia, that means one thing, uh, but to college grads, that also means another thing. Uh, and if you think about your time in college, maybe it's four, five, six, seven, eight years that, um, you know, folks have been in school. Maybe you've been in school or you see your kids or your nephews or your grandchildren uh, spending all that time in school. They get done. And now what? What do they do next? Um, you know, the world can change in four, five, six, seven, eight years. And, and COVID is a perfect example. Is that an anomaly? I like to think so. I hope so. Uh, but if you think of someone that started school in 2019 and graduated in 2023 or 2024, imagine how different the world was five years ago or four years ago to what it looks like today. Uh, the idea of working remote never would have thought of it four years ago. Now, everybody wants it. It's an expectation for everybody that graduates. If you don't get it, you're finding somewhere else to work uh, for better or for worse. But but it's a changing environment and, and we have to adapt to that. Um, so especially with the folks that graduate, talking about those career opportunities is probably the number one thing that, that folks are focused on is they approach their senior year, their last year of school. There's a number of other things too. And like Linda said, I'm not too far removed and hopefully that's a little bit obvious. I'm keeping my youth. Uh, there's a lot of other things too that, that come with graduation or taking that next step. Where do you work? What benefits do you get? Like working remote, like unlimited vacation time. I guess that's a thing. I don't exactly know what that means, but some people have it. Um, Budgeting, you know, now you've got a salary. What can you spend? What can you save? Most folks have student debt uh, more than ever. How do you tackle that student debt? What's the right way to do it? What's the timing of that? How much should you be paying off uh, on your loans versus saving? Rent versus buy is eventually something that people think about. Am I better off renting an apartment or buying a home? Um, then maybe further down the line for some sooner than later, marriage. Uh, eventually after marriage, children. Uh, all of those things, whether you believe it or not, are, are related to your financials, you know, either for, for you or for someone else, for your partner, for your kids. Um, so what, what does that mean for the next gen? What does that mean for, and I'll focus on millennials. I, I'm on the borderline of the millennial generation, so I'm going to talk about us for a second here, but hopefully this is relevant to your family as well. 
Uh, so there's a study here from Georgetown University. Um, and, and if you can read at the top where it says figure three, the, the point here, and I'll, I'll talk about the visualization a bit, is that since 1980, the cost of college skyrocketed while the earnings of young adults, and in this case, it's uh, adults 22 through 27, have increased much more slowly. So we see that since 1980, costs over the last 40 years uh, have almost, I guess that's a, a triple, if you go up 200%, I think that's a triple, panelists confirm, I think I'm thinking of that right, they've increased by 180%. Um, so in 40 years, we've seen that, or maybe that's double, but we'll go with it's increased a lot. Um, wages have not risen all that much. Uh, between 1980 and, and 2020, um, wages have risen 20%. That's a significant gap. So what does that mean? A lot more debt, a lot less income. When you've got a lot of debt and not so much income, that's a significant gap. You can't tackle those things and start to make the savings that you want to make, make those decisions that you want to make. Um, so it's it's really forcing, unfortunately, uh, the younger generation, Gen Z, uh, millennials as well, to just start from below zero. Uh, and, and that's tough. Nobody wants to be there, but it's the reality of, of the environment today. So on this next slide, uh, this is from uh, intelligent.com. It's from intelligent.com, so it's got to be good. Uh, but we look at on the graph on the left-hand side here, the chart on the left-hand side, approximately how much money do you have in your 401k retirement account? I want to call out the three uh, three lines or the three bars that are highlighted pink or reddish here, depending on uh, your screen. On the far left, it says about 13% of folks have less than $1,000 in their 401k retirement account. I should say that this, these are for folks 22 and 32, um, so a little bit different gap uh, or, or demographic than the last slide. Between $1,000 and $5,000 in their 401k, that's about 11%, and then no 401k account at all, it's about 15%. So if we look at the surveyed folks and maybe apply this, and I know folks that love statistics, maybe I shouldn't generalize, but I'm going to, 40% of young folks between 22 and 32 have no 401k. That's not necessarily always their only savings account, but if we make this conversation easy, they've got no savings or very little savings, 40% of millennials. Um, that's, and I guess in, in some Gen Z, that's it's not a good sign. Uh, and, and when you graduate, when you get a career, when you start earning income, we preach as planners, all of us, and your financial advisor as well, is save, save, save. It's the number one thing you can do for your retirement and get, get you to where you want to go is save. You can make as much money in the market as, as you think you can, but that's not guaranteed. What you put into an account is guaranteed. You can control that. On the second chart, so on the right-hand side here, do you plan to do any of the following in order to start paying your federal student loans again? Uh, so federal student loans, uh, they came due again in October, or payments are now expected beginning this month. Uh, and they were for, I don't remember the right word. You didn't have to make them for the past three years due to COVID, now you do again. So if you take a look, and I won't read through everything on this chart here, uh, but some folks are gonna dip into savings accounts. It's not the point. The point of the savings account is the, say this, hopefully in the right way, the cover your butt account, something comes up, that savings is to save your butt, not to pay your student loans. Um, do we have to work more potentially? Do I have to eat uh, less steak? Um, more ramen. I don't mean to laugh because that's the situation that some folks are in, but as you cut down on food and groceries, that's that's something that could happen. Um, so if you read down you know, the rest of the chart, it's a lot of sacrifices that folks are gonna have to make uh, or have already made to get to the places that, that they wanna go. So here's sort of the synopsis or the, or the takeaway from the context that I've hopefully laid out pretty clearly. As you can see on the chart, this is a chart of um, baby boomers compared to millennials and decisions that they've delayed because of, of financials or their personal financial situation. So the respondents to this survey and the pink, those are baby boomers. So 23% of baby boomers said that they delayed buying a home due to financial reasons. 50% of millennials are now affected by that decision. Uh, you hear about equity and home equity and I've got the home I wanna pass. 50% of millennials can't do that or at least haven't started doing that yet, haven't considered it because of things like debt because of things like rising costs of housing, um, food, groceries, eggs were like three bucks a, a year ago. And now they're more realistic or better, but three and a half bucks. Uh, there's a few other things here too, uh, but one I wanna call out as well is entering a relationship or ending a relationship. Now I'm sure you're thinking, CJ, what the heck does that have to do with financials? It, maybe it does, and I know some of you guys know what I mean, men and women. I know some folks are significant others can be expensive. But what I really wanna call out here is, is the health and the happiness that this sacrifices. Relationships can be awesome, especially when you get into one, the honeymoon phase. 
it's the best time of people's lives, especially for those folks that go on to marry that person or spend their life with that person. Um, also, it can be really tough to get out of a relationship. And when you're stuck in something that isn't great, isn't where you want to be, you're sacrificing your happiness as well. So all of these decisions that you see on this chart, are they financially relevant? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, are they going to affect someone's happiness and overall well-being? 100%. And I think that's more important. I think that's the context that non-millennials, um, it, it's important for them to have and, and to keep in their back pocket as they have these conversations. And I can say anecdotally, um, I get to the to the Thanksgiving table and I get the, where's your girlfriend? And why don't you have a house? And when are you having kids? And that car's nice. When's you get the nicer one? Um, I've got student loans. I've got a car loan. I've got all this stuff going on. Um, so I'm right here. I fit this bill. So I, I'm here and I get it. And it's not to say that our generation is overly sensitive. I think that that's something that I'd like to debunk a little bit. Uh, but these things affect us personally. It's not just about the money. It's it's the the feelings of maybe embarrassment about not being in a relationship, slowing or not having a house when your friends and your buddies do or your parents did when they were 22 and you're almost 30 years old and still renting. Um, you know, that, that makes the conversation really tough. So my, my ask, and Linda brought this up, my ask of everybody here that as you think about the nephews, the nieces, the grandchildren, the, the sons, the daughters, um, think about asking about their situation, not telling them where they should be, not telling them you should do this, but asking about, hey, have you thought about this? Or have you considered this? Or how can I help you think about this? Or how can I help you make this decision based on what I've seen? And not everybody's experience is gonna be the same. I recognize that. Uh, but hopefully uh, laying out this context uh, will be helpful in the conversations that you have because Lord knows when I see my Aunt Jenny, she's going to ask me all these questions. And I wish she was here, but I know I'm going to get those questions. Uh, so, Julie, we did we did a lot of talking so far about uh, the verticals within the family. Um, so I, I do want to kick it to you to, and this might be a tougher conversation, uh, to talk about the horizontal, so siblings. Great. Thanks, CJ. Uh, but I have to share with you as you were going through and also what Linda was going through, it did make me uh, think of a couple of things. Uh, one is my children are in their 30s and my husband and I are still surprised when we'll talk about something and we're like, well, you remember that. And we're like, we weren't born yet then. We were three <laughs> because we, we forget that our children and I'm sure grandparents weren't there to observe our whole life. They've only been here for this little piece of time. And, and that's where I think Linda's storytelling could really help too with that next generation uh, and the next generation asking, you, you know, what was it like when you were my age? Because they weren't here. They didn't know that. And uh, likely you'll hear stories of similar struggles at that age. Uh, that you've only known your parents or grandparents since they had established careers and everything was going great. Uh, but there were early struggles, a lot of uncertainties early on that, you know, sharing those stories could be really helpful, uh, both from those shared experiences and just to normalize what a lot of our children and grandchildren are feeling now. Uh, and they live in a world that's so much more uncertain even than the ones where we came of age in. So, so I think that's really helpful. Um, and you're right, sibling discussions are, are a whole nother level, uh, but I think, and, and I wanna do it especially from the lens of aging parents, uh, that Thanksgiving is often a time when siblings are together and it's a really good time to start to address some of the really hard issues, both between siblings as well as with your parents. Uh, we are doing so much work right now in revising estate tax documents because there's some law changes coming in 2025. And I know all of us on this call are having those conversations every day with clients. And often we're finding a lot of those documents haven't been updated since 2012, the last time we had a really big estate law change. Uh, but more than just what's in the document and how do those estate taxes play out, a lot of things I think we don't discuss are really the roles that all of us might play in each other's estate planning. So when I talk about estate planning documents, talking about really just the core documents, uh, there's a durable power of attorney of who's going to handle the financial affairs, health care powers of attorney or directives, depending on what state you in, wills, revocable living trust. In all of those documents, 
all of us have appointed someone to stand in our place if we're no longer able to do that, even if it's for a temporary point in time, like a health care or a durable power of attorney, if we're just incapacitated. Often that's our spouse, but then it often then goes to children. So as siblings, I think it's really important that we kind of band together and make sure we all understand critical things um, about each other's planning as well as our parents' planning to make sure if, there's no surprises, that we're, we are not at that crisis moment that an event happens before any of us really knows the role that we each play in that and what that can mean. Uh, and that's where a lot of the family dynamics come in as well. So as, as we look at these, uh, and it may be you know something I know siblings have, I've got some that we're working with now, we're actually writing down and they're doing some practice conversations with us before they get home and have these conversations with their with their parents um, so they really can understand <clears throat> might have naturally defaulted to the oldest child to serve as that health care power of attorney but the eldest child lives a thousand miles away from the parents right now but there's two siblings living right there in town that really tend to the needs of their health doesn't make any sense logistically to have that eldest child be the one still named. So understanding what all of those are and having some transparent discussion around that is really critical for everyone involved. Hey, so here's Julie, some... can I ask a, a question quick here? Sure. Sorry, to, I apologize for cutting you off. So say, yep. say I don't have a, a POA, say I don't have a will, say I don't have any of those things. Where can I get them? And I've, I've heard and I personally have downloaded a will from the Wisconsin website, that's where I am in Milwaukee. Is that something that is okay? How should I go about getting those documents, creating them, establishing them? Yeah, I, 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 that's a great question, CJ. And it's a great thing to bring up in those holiday conversations to ask some of the adults in your family that have done this, who would you suggest I use? Because there's something to be said for having a continuity, you know, having a, a family kind of attorney that knows every member of the family and can help with that. So I think that's a great thing to bring up. There are all kinds of things online. It is very state specific. So if uh, you live in Wisconsin, but if you're going to Illinois for a family and all your family lives in Illinois, that's not a good choice for you. You really should have an attorney that's licensed to practice in the, in the state where you live. That's really important because those all vary a lot. So I think that's critical, uh, but it, it is. Uh, I've got a story uh, actually from yesterday for someone that you all know, someone that's on our team that just got married. And uh, she was so proud because she got all of her emails all changed and updated to her new married last name. I'm like, oh, that's so good. So did you change all your beneficiary elections? Did you change your durable power of attorney or medical power of attorney? And she just sunk down in her chair. She's like, I thought I was doing so good. You just added 10 things to my list. So uh, it's also all of those things are also important if you have children that have turned 18. I remember spoiling one of my friend's child's birthday party. She called she said, oh, I got to go. You know, it's my daughter's turning 18 today. We're going out to dinner. I'm like, great. So you got a health care power of attorney. You put the car in her name. I went down that whole checklist, which we have online for uh, our clients of when your children turn 18, they are adults and they need all of these documents in a very simplified form, but they need them just as much. So that, uh, great question, CJ. And really, these are all things that you should discuss uh, you know, among your siblings, because often you've named each other in documents. Make sure if you've named one of your siblings to play a specific role in your planning, to make sure that they're aware of it and that they accept and are comfortable with that responsibility is really big help. The other thing that uh, I see a lot of siblings do, we're working with a couple of families right now, and they're like, okay, here's our goal when we go home. We're all going to be at mom and dad's. We know nothing about even where everything is. Uh, so just making sure they actually know where documents are, that they know who their parents, CPA and advisor and attorney is, and, and then having some conversations with their parents about aging. Uh, it's really hard. Uh, I've found 
get most comfortable to speak in parables uh, rather than just directly asking. So you're getting really old. What are we going to do? How, how do you want this? To, so instead, share conversations and stories that we all have with our friends. I'm, you know, had lunch with a friend the other day and their mother just had this health event happen and uh, the daughter had to step in and take over everything. She didn't know where everything was. So in addition to being so concerned about her mother's health, she also had all these other things just to make sure the rent still got paid and the insurance and didn't know where anything that was and it was just a disaster. Uh, so sometimes you know, telling stories and speaking in parables a little bit is an easy way to ease into some of those conversations, uh, but making sure that everyone in the family is prepared. So then when, you know, life happens that you do have, uh, it, it doesn't get further become a crisis because of all the financial concerns while you're trying to deal with all the emotional or health issues or other things that just happen as you go through this. Um, Linda, I can't think of how many families I've seen you go through with this and how do you help uh, the parents? How do you help them understand that it's such a blessing to their families for them to start to share information and to start to have conversations within their family? So, Julie, I love the fact that you talk in parables as well. There are many books that we all read that have parables in them. That's why we read, I think, to be able to relate to something. So that is one approach. But the other with the elder generation is some, my mother cannot use GPS. She tries really hard. She's, she's 79 years old, and she just gets really frustrated on the car because it, she can't figure the GPS out. But she has roadmaps in her, her, her glove box. And so we actually pull out the roadmap so she can see the lay of the land. And that would be a way that I would approach the older generation, elder generation, and asking them, how am I going to know what to do without the roadmap? So make it an analogy and ask them if they can detail out what is the roadmap they have in place today. And it just it just makes perfect sense. We won't know where to go. We won't know where to turn or where we have to turn because of the legal documents in place if I don't know where they are and what they say. Thank you. Uh, and Jonathan, uh, you and I have been working with this family for maybe almost two years of uh, the parents that are extremely charitable and their children know it and appreciate it. And they know that most of the family's wealth when they pass will go to charity. And, and you've seen the parents wanting the children to get involved, but the children are like, well, that's really, you know, their wealth and for them to do with, and we appreciate that. How, how do you help both the parents build that bridge of inviting them into the conversation and the children, um, deciding how they want to and what what questions they have that's a, uh you've just been so masterful about really guiding family conversations with uh an advisor who has such a great close relationship with his family how how does how does that start how do you start that conversation well it really is making sure that it is a conversation that's that is the beginning uh, point for any of this uh what we realize is going into any relationship, whether it's a family relationship, friend relationship, a work relationship, there's always assumptions that we come into. And those uh, assumptions can be self-defeating. You know, in some of these families, uh, the one generation might be upset that the other generation is not doing something. And the other generation is saying, well, we don't uh, we don't feel like it's their place where we haven't been invited yet, or we feel like we might be stepping on someone's toes if we do that. And so when it's always maybe a kind of an us versus them, even if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be adversarial, but they're still coming from the, the picture or coming from the scenario, uh, just from different angles and different different perspectives, different different age groups, different experiences. And so being able to have it a shared experience that's really what it comes down to is how can how can we help 
what would you like us to see? What, what can we do together? And when we turn that into a, a way from delegating of, well, you need to step up and do more of this particular thing, or why won't, why won't they do more of this particular thing into how can we work together? That conversation is the key. Right, and I see we're starting to get some questions in our chat box in about five minutes. We're going to switch to those. So feel free to uh, add your questions to there as well. We're all happy to share whatever experiences, whatever information would be most helpful to you. Um, and, and CJ, I, you know, I've just got to go back to your TikTok comment before uh, because I, my mother's getting ready to turn 90 and she's like, it's just not my world anymore. And I, I said, you know, mom, it's about to be not my world because AI will take us through a whole nother level of evolution uh, that will be where, you know, I didn't grow up but, and wasn't used to working with. And that's where I think, you know, people in your generation can add such value to families. So uh, what, are, what are some things you might suggest that uh, people that are in your generation might do that would be helpful to starting those conversations. And uh, yeah, you had some really good thoughts about how parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles could ask the, your generation questions, but speaking to people in your generation, what are some things that to help them be proactive and really adding value to that family conversation and initiating some of it? Yeah, so one thing I'll say about the whole TikTok thing, um, there are financial preachers on TikTok uh, I, I don't, I won't say don't trust everything they say, but don't trust everything they say. Uh, they've got some ideas and there's the tax gurus that promote themselves as this, that, and the other thing that frankly can be very wrong. Um, so if you hear something, if you're interested in something, if you want to learn more, um, Julie, this is just going back on the TikTok and it's an advisor plug. Ask your advisor, uh, you know, talk to them. I heard this. I, trust me, if it's something that's goofy and it seems wrong, you'll get a laugh together uh, about it. And that's totally okay. That's what your Baird advisor is here for. That's what we're here for as well. Uh, so with my friends or my generation specifically, uh, I'm having more and more friends ask me about their 401k, their benefits. What does this mean? How should I be doing this? Uh, I have a buddy. Um, we did it kind of jokingly. Uh, we, we text all the time, but he started emailing me. He said, what's your email? I want to do this in a professional way. He sent me a student loan information. Um, is that really personal? Yeah, absolutely. And do you want your buddies to know how much you're in debt or how much you make? Generally not. Um, but he knows what I do. He knows that I'm coming at it from an objective lens and, and opening that door to just give him a little bit of guidance of, hey, these are the loans that have the highest interest rate. I know you know what that means, but feel comfortable about paying that off because you can't get, can't earn that much elsewhere. Uh, can you, I guess? Yes. Are you guaranteed? No, you're guaranteed to pay six and a half percent on this loan. If you've got the money for it, knock it out. If you feel comfortable, knock it out. Um, I think that's a really important thing too, and, and I didn't mean to hype myself up with this one, but it's really important to include the qualitative side. Are you comfortable doing this? And, and we talked about the stories and the values. Uh, do you feel comfortable? Is this what you actually want? Are you gonna be okay with this? So is it great to knock down debt? For sure. Uh, are some people comfortable having debt? For sure. Uh, I'm somewhere in the middle. Uh, I, I like to walk the talk, but sometimes I don't. Uh, so I'm somewhere in the middle, but I think just offering, uh, you know, especially for me, it's easier. I do this, but offering that, Hey, I just had this conversation about my 401k. Did you know this? You don't have to go into details, uh, 25, 26, 27, 28 year olds. I don't really care so much about those details. They kind of put some money in the way, but there's a lot of new stuff that my generation is, is now walking into that just it, it's easy to share. Hey, did you hear about this? No. Okay. Done. At least they're going to think about that now that and that's okay. So hopefully that that answers your question, Julie. It's probably more long winded than you were expecting, but no, long... no, it's great. But something you said made me think of something that is really important. That I think you could walk into your parents or grandparents' house and be a huge help with, and that's cybersecurity. You know, asking if you're in grandma's house, just asking some questions. Where do you keep your passwords? How often do you change them? Do you, do you know what phishing is? Just, uh, we are seeing such an increase in um, 
especially senior adults being the victim of different cyber events that that I think that could also be uh, an important holiday conversation just to make sure that especially your older relatives are safe and are um, have an awareness of what might be out there that might be some bad actors really trying to take advantage of them in different types of social media and things. So, so I think some conversations around that could be helpful as well. Uh, and with that, we're at uh, about 10 till. We want to leave some time for questions. CJ, I know you're, you've been keeping track of those, Corbin as well. So what questions do the people in our audience have for us? Yeah, and I'm going to go from first in, first out. So we're doing a FIFO method. Any accountants out there, you'll appreciate this. Uh, first question, can you do, Jonathan, this one's for you. Can you do QCDs from a 401k or only an IRA? This can be from an IRA, but uh, it is something that's fairly easy to do and uh, work with your advisor. You can do a rollover of a particular portion of your 401k. It doesn't have to be the entirety of it. You can do that uh, and get it out of the 401k to, that way as a rollover and still be able to take advantage of those those benefits of a QCD. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Julie, this one's for you and you were prompted in the question. So this one's going directly to you. Uh, do you have any suggestions if elderly mom wants to name me, so the audience member, is POA but doesn't want to share any general financial info with me, audience member? It seems like it would be good to have some idea before an emergency arises. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, uh, completely understand that. We hear that all the time. Oh, you'll need, you can just call X when the time comes and they'll tell you everything. Uh, I think that's really where those transparent conversations need to happen. That if, if that power of attorney is being activated, that means something's happened to her. So as that, I assume it's probably a child, uh, saying so if something's happened to your parent that's caused that power of attorney to be activated you're going to be dealing with a lot more other than the financial affairs and i think you know having that conversation and sharing that would be helpful what we see is hesitancy on the part of parents a lot is just to say i've got three million dollars and it's here and this is it you know to share some of those figures so um, if i was the person that asked the question i would try to approach it, look, I don't need to know dollar amounts. I just need to know where things are if I need them, who to contact. I need to know what of your bills are automatically taken out of your checking account, which ones I should be going to the mailbox to make sure happen. I just need some more information. You don't have to disclose a lot of numbers to me, but for me to be able to do this, and to do that at a time where I know I'm already going to be very stressed because something is going on with your health to activate this power of attorney, help me help you. I think oftentimes people get hung up on they're hesitant to share the numbers and we don't need to know all the details of the numbers. We need the information of where things are and how to best do that. So that'd be my suggestion. Yeah, that was perfect. Uh, and, and one thing, and this is, this is generally a shot in the dark, but it's something I thought about as you were talking and it's been relevant in my family. And that's why I bring it up. I believe, or at least I know Wisconsin does. And I did this because I was being nosy. They've got a search function online where you can search for outstanding money. Basically, um, that's been reported that hasn't been touched. That's just floating out there. Uh, people pass all the time, and if you don't know the the asset location or location of assets, there could be money that was forgotten about or a 401k plan that never rolled over. Things like that do get reported. Um, sometimes, I, I think it's fair to say, I wish all the time, but there there are opportunities to search even just online. It's that easy to search for a last name and a state and see what could be out there. So is, are you going to hit the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? I hope. I, I hope you do. That'd be awesome. Um, unlikely, but there could be something there. So that's something to think about. Um, this I'll, I'll ask for everybody too, and this is related. So I'm skipping the FIFO right now. Our two children, 53 and 55, really have no idea of our net worth. Should we tell them? Uh, we have been through <laughs> so many. I, I, they should have some type of awareness. And I guess we'll start by something that we all talk about a lot. 
who your children are going to be. Some people are, oh, I don't want my children to feel entitled and I don't want to ruin them. If they're 53 and 54, they are whoever they're going to be. So you're not going to ruin them. Uh, I, I'll tell you a book that I'd recommend uh, that those uh, people read. It's called Die With Zero. Oh, that's the other intentional <laughs> one. Uh, but Die With Zero is really one that's about how do you take things out of your, um, maybe out of your will and incorporate that into your life plan. So it's, um, and share a personal example with you. My mom and I were flying to Las Vegas to see her latest great grandson. Again, she's gonna be 90. And she was in the middle, I was on the window and there was a man on the aisle and he was reading that book and I'm like, Oh my God, that's one of my favorite books. I give it to clients all the time. And my mom looked at me disgusted. She's like, so why haven't you given it to me to read? <laughs> uh, and so I immediately did. She read it, but it, um, you don't have to agree with everything in the book, but it will challenge your thinking and be a good uh, kind of checklist where you go through. How do I feel about that? Because what we see sometimes uh, if people pass and their children have absolutely no idea, um, it, that's never the best situation uh, because you miss that opportunity to share with them the purpose of what you're leaving to them is going to have for their life. What did they want this to mean in my life? Do they want me to give it away? Do they want me to not spend it, pass it on to my children? Do they, what were they thinking? Uh, and to, there's so many people that said, I'd just give anything to be able to go back and ask my mom, what, what did she want me to do with this? Because, and then they're guessing the rest of their life. Am I doing what they wanted? So we strongly encourage conversations with an appropriate level of detail. Julie, I love that. I love that comment that you ended on there because uh, a lot of times we come from this sort of perspective of, we don't want to cause trouble. We don't want to cause frustration. We don't want to cause any sort of dysfunction by bringing up some issues. And really it comes down, you're, all you're doing is delaying it and you're delaying it to a point when now there's nothing we can do about it. You know, it you're, not, you're not avoiding the problem. You're just delaying it and eventually making it worse there. And Julie, to put a punctuation mark on what you said, one of the greatest gifts my father ever gave me prior to his passing was walking me through where everything was, how it was titled, how to access it, and the dollar amounts. So that as, um, as a confidant to my mom, I could help her navigate all of this while she was in emotional distress. Did it ruin me? I don't think so. Remember, he had all those values he taught me early on. So I think the fear is more in our head at this stage of the game. And the gift is knowing. So there are a handful left. I know we've only got about two minutes, so I'm going to jump in and, and pick a relatively short one. I don't know if we want to jump into the resources or if we just continue answering questions. I'll let the panel decide there too. Uh, here's a really good one though, and this is related to, um, you brought up cybersecurity, right? One of those things like you brought up is passwords. So the question here is if you are the POA and don't know the person's passwords, assuming that, that the person has passed, what happens? How do you get those? <laughs> it's a nightmare. Uh, plain and simple. Uh, there are lots of great apps that allow you to collect all the passwords in one place uh, because you're changing so often, leaving them written down somewhere is a bad idea anyway. So I would encourage your, um, if you're in that situation to make sure whoever you are a power of attorney for, uses one of those apps to collect all of their passwords in one place on a continuous basis. And you just have to know that one site, that one password to be able to have access to everything. Um, Cause it, it is truly a nightmare. And also in your state planning documents, uh, you need to make sure that you're covering your digital estate as well as all of your financial affairs as well. So that people have the ability to go down and shut down your Facebook account and, and LinkedIn and Instagram and TikTok and all everything. So you have a digital footprint and a digital estate, just like you have financial assets. So 
Thank you, uh, all three of you, Jonathan, Linda, CJ. We could talk all day because we have such a passion for helping our advisors work with their clients who they care so much about, about having some of these critical conversations. On here, you'll see some of the things we gathered as some of our favorite resources uh, that we think are uh, very helpful to facilitating conversations. We hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving season and uh, that you have some intention in the conversations that you have around the dinner table this year when you all are full of gratitude being gathered back with your family. We wish you the very best and thank you for your time today. Just as we're wrapping up a few closing comments here um, again, want to thank um, all of the presenters here on the panel very much for your candor and comments and thank everyone on the line for your time. Um, just quickly as, as we're wrapping up for those who would like to review today's presentation, uh, maybe share it with a friend, family member or colleague. The session has been recorded and will be made available in approximately a week um, through your Baird, Baird financial advisor or via BairdWealth.com. Um, so check out uh, BairdWealth.com or, or talk to your Baird financial advisor for that recording. Um, if we were not able to address your question or if you would like additional information, please feel free to reach out to your Baird contact. They'll connect you with the appropriate resource um, to get that question answered. So with that, thank you, um, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, panelists. Talk to you soon. Thank you.